For most of us, it's difficult to comprehend a life behind bars. But inside America's female prisons, 55 violent offenders have only the passing of time to contemplate their fate. If I could turn back time and do things over, none of this would have ever happened. I would have never hurt anybody. He said that I would have the X amount of voltage going through my body because I was sentenced to die by the electric chair. I knew from the beginning that I would be found guilty. And I knew from the beginning that I would get the death penalty. I'm innocent. I'm not guilty of murder. But how did they end up here? What is their side of the story? And what will be their fate? Find out next. These are the women on death row. I've never wanted to die. I lost everything I ever cared about. Everything. Almost like every day is your last. I want to stay alive for me, because if I'm going to die in here, I'm going to die for my truth. I think I'm going to wake up from this nightmare. <laughs> In the past 30 years, 138 women have been sentenced to death in the United States. 11 have been executed, nine by lethal injection, two in the electric chair. But sometimes it's the waiting to die that is so excruciating. It's hard knowing that an execution date is coming and you don't know if your attorney is going to get the appeal in in time to get a stay of execution, and that's really hard during that time. It's been almost 20 years since Elizabeth Green was sentenced to death for the violent murder of an elderly man in Cincinnati, Ohio. Since then, she's lived nearly half of her life in a cell block. Basically, I'm a model inmate. That helps a lot. I do a lot of helping others within the institution. Being here and going through what I've been through and people that I've hurt, you know, I did a lot of growing up. Perhaps no other convict understands the complex legal process better than Elizabeth Green. After four years on death row and with all of her legal appeals exhausted, Elizabeth's final execution date was set. It was only through a rare and controversial stroke of luck that her life was spared. On January 11, 1991, just four days before he was leaving office after his eighth year in office, Governor Richard F. Celeste used his entire power in the Constitution as governor to grant clemency for eight people on death row. Reporter Alan Johnson covered this story for the Columbus Dispatch back in 1991. I would say the public in Ohio was pretty much outraged at that point because they saw the possibility anyway that people, murderers, would be out walking the streets. Elizabeth Green's life was spared, but her new sentence of life without parole meant she would never get out of prison. Even today, Former Ohio Governor Richard Celeste stands by his decision to spare Elizabeth Green's life. Race was a factor. And um, when you have four women on death row and all four women are black, three of them from the same county, you have both a uh, racial and a geographic disparity that is hard to explain. Former state prosecutor Ted Franchek presented the state's original case against Elizabeth Green in 1988. When the governor then says there are four women on death row and I'm just going to give them a pardon, I'm going to commute their sentence because they're women, I didn't think that was the correct way for him to use his, use his power because I don't think he looked at Elizabeth Green's case individually. I didn't necessarily agree with it, but he's the governor. Her case went through all of the legal appeals and the case was upheld. Lieutenant Larry Powell, a 33-year veteran with the Cincinnati Police Department, was one of the first investigators to arrive at the inner city crime scene. This was probably one of the most brutal uh, homicide scenes that I had seen up until that point. 
Lying dead in a pool of his own blood, 71-year-old Tommy Willis, a longtime resident and respected elder in the community, had been stabbed over a hundred times. This was an old man who lived here who didn't bother anybody, who actually, in the street culture, helped people out. Elizabeth Green was no stranger to the inner city. Abused and neglected as a child, she grew up surrounded by poverty and little opportunity. She eventually turned to drugs. At 24, I was just a drug addict, uneducated. I didn't care about nothing. I believe today I really didn't know no better, because if I had, I wouldn't be here now. On January 4th, 1988, Elizabeth was visiting her friend, Belinda Coulter, when they both decided to get high on cocaine. Neither had enough money to make the purchase. Belinda knew her neighbor, Mr. Willis, would be willing to pay cash for Elizabeth's $40 book of food stamps. The two went to visit Willis and quickly completed the transaction. I had no reason to get high. And I just did because I liked it. There was no reason. But the party was just getting started. Elizabeth and Belinda would spend the rest of the day smoking crack, boozing, and according to investigators, spinning violently out of control. The next morning, a concerned neighbor noticed Willis's door was left ajar. She immediately called 911, but it was too late. Whoever did it wanted to make sure that he was dead, when able to identify him. Police arrived at the gruesome crime scene. It appeared to be a botched robbery attempt, but with no witnesses or suspects, investigators started processing the crime scene for clues. The first thing they noticed was a child's bloody tube sock. We found a bloody shoe print that indicated that it was probably a woman. We had two different blood types, which led us to believe that the suspect had probably cut themselves during this altercation. Several weeks would pass before a reluctant informant stepped forward. Detectives learned that Belinda Coulter was seen visiting Tommy Willis the same day he was murdered. Belinda Coulter admitted she had sold Mr. Willis some food stamps. They took that money and bought drugs with it. After that interview, that led us to Elizabeth Green. Right away, uh, one of the things that we noticed with uh, Elizabeth was that she had a cut on her third finger on her right hand. Detective Powell continued his interrogation until Elizabeth Green finally admitted to her involvement in the crime. She gave us a full confession. And during her confession, she implicated Belinda Coulter. And they gave a little conflicting stories as to who was the more aggressor in, in the crime. Eventually, they both confessed to the crime. They wanted more drugs. Uh, they knew that uh, Mr. Willis had a substantial sum of cash on him. When they entered his apartment, they robbed him, and in the process of the robbery, violently murdered him by stabbing him multiple times about the face and neck. We later interviewed them, the both of uh, Linda Coulter and Elizabeth Green, and they admitted that they put children's socks on their hands so that they wouldn't leave fingerprints on them. Green is now reluctant to talk about the murder. I remember bits and pieces of what happened. I remember bits and pieces. Okay, I was a drug addict and I knew I shouldn't have been out there robbing folks. Knowing there's a possibility a life could be taken, that's exactly what happened. Elizabeth Green and Belinda Coulter were tried separately for their participation in the robbery murder scheme. But Belinda would be offered a plea bargain in exchange for a reduced sentence to testify against Elizabeth. She turned state evidence against me, so it was basically her word against mine. I think the decision was made that um, 
that Elizabeth Green was the principal offender, that she was the one that wielded the knife, that she was the one that stabbed Mr. Willis multiple times. I never not admitted my involvement in this crime. I've always been honest from the beginning. And I have never admitted to taking a life, but I admitted my involvement. But of course, don't nobody want to hear, or oh, you didn't kill this man. So why, I don't, know, I don't even bother trying to prove my innocence on that. I admit my involvement, and that's it, and that's all. Elizabeth's trial lasted only three days. The prosecution was able to prove that even though Belinda was present, it was Elizabeth who violently bludgeoned Tommy Willis to death. Elizabeth Green was found guilty, and on July 7, 1988, she was sentenced to death by electrocution. I thought I was going to fall out. And the judge sent me to die. He said that I would have the X amount of voltage going through my body because I was sentenced to die by the electric chair. And I thought I was going to pass out because I couldn't believe this was happening. As a condition of her plea bargain, Belinda Coulter pled guilty to a reduced charge of involuntary manslaughter. She managed to avoid a death sentence and received a maximum 50-year prison term. Well, I received a death penalty. I have a co-defendant, and I feel that both of us should have received the same amount of time, which didn't happen that way. I think Elizabeth Green got the proper sentence that she was entitled to in this case, and in this case, it was the death penalty, absolutely. At no time did I suggest that these crimes were not horrendous, but I don't think that the death penalty is the right response. Elizabeth Green would spend a total of five years on death row before being permanently transferred to the general prison population. Well, now that I'm off death row, I'm very blessed but I'm doing a life without parole sentence. And from my homework, you know, reading the law books and everything, my sentence is an illegal sentence. When they first took me off death row, I should have been given a life sentence with parole eligibility, and I wasn't. So now I fight to receive a parole date. And that's what I've been doing. I don't see any chance of, of any court looking at her case again. She got life without parole at a time that there really wasn't life without parole in Ohio, but in essence there was a special governor's order to take her off of death row, uh, and sort of the, the other side of it was, but you'll never get out of prison. People have no idea what it's like to walk in my shoes. I have family, but they don't care nothing about me. I haven't had a vision like three, four, five years. I am by myself. I am by myself. Should she have the opportunity to get out? Yeah, I think she should have the opportunity to show that she has uh, progressed educationally, progressed socially, uh, and that she's fit to, to, to live in society. I have changed. I'm older, I'm more wiser. Um, they will have to take a chance on me. I mean, I won't be the first inmate society has taken a chance on. No one knows if I'm gonna go out there and do the same thing, but they have to give me a chance to prove myself. That's the only way they'll know. She killed another human being violently, and uh, the sentence should be very long. I think she should be thankful that, in fact, she didn't get the death penalty that she was sentenced to. She has life, whereas Mr. Tommy Willis no longer has life because of her actions. I don't think we should assume that uh, the death penalty is the ultimate uh, punishment that uh, can act as a deterrent. I think life without parole is a very effective sentence. Elizabeth Green would agree. Ironically, she feels the sparing of her life was a double-edged sword. The question is, how much time is enough time? 30, 40, 50 years? I don't feel I deserve that. 
I deserve a chance to be free again. What I have a passion for is justice. And when I see something I don't feel is just, then I feel motivated to speak out about it. Kathleen O'Shea has never spent a day in a death row cell, but as a social worker and one of the foremost experts on female offenders, she is intimate with their experience. When I was a graduate student, I participated in a study uh, of women in prison and I met, had the opportunity to meet and talk to a woman on death row. She was very easy to talk to. She didn't strike me as a any, brutal in any way. That first fateful meeting was with Lois Nadine Smith, convicted of killing her son's ex-girlfriend. Well, it changed my whole way of thinking uh, because somewhere I must have thought that people who are on death row are brutal people and it should be shut out from society. Since then, O'Shea has dedicated nearly 15 years to researching and corresponding with death row inmates. She now fights for improved prison conditions and humane treatment, even for the worst offenders. The first book I wrote was Women and the Death Penalty in the United States. Most of us don't ever expect to meet anybody on death row in our lifetimes. So I wanted to share that experience so that other people could know about it and be aware of it. Currently, there are 55 women sitting on death row in the U.S. According to O'Shea, many are subjected to unthinkable physical and mental abuse. Women on death row are dehumanized in so many ways. It's a very, very closed society. And it's hard to know what's happening there. It's, it's about human rights and the right to be treated as a human being, regardless of who you are or what you did. Perhaps her compassion is not by accident. O'Shea served as a Catholic nun for almost 30 years. In her second book, Revelations from Both Sides of the Bars, O'Shea hoped to show how and why their misfortune could also be ours. Most people think that women on death row deserve to be there. And many people on death row are there by pure accident. So I think the biggest misconception is that they're any different than the rest of us. Like so many of the women on death row that confide in O'Shea, Andrea Hicks Jackson admits her guilt in the 1983 shooting of a Jacksonville police officer. Being on death row changed my life immensely. Basically, most of the time you were in your room 23 hours a day, unless you had a call out or something. On the weekends, we didn't come out at all. You were in there 24 hours a day. In the first letter I received from Andrea, she told me about her life on death row, and she spoke about, uh, she's a very religious woman, so she wrote about her belief in God and uh, her children. In 1983, Andrea Jackson was a drug addict and alcoholic. A victim of child abuse, Jackson found herself trapped in an abusive marriage. I had made up my mind either he's going to end up killing me and I'm like, oh, I'm going to end up killing him. Fearing for her life, Jackson bought a small handgun for protection and finally found the courage to leave her husband. But that also meant abandoning her two little boys. Alone and desperate, Jackson fell deep into a two-week drug and alcohol binge. I did a lot of drugs. I stayed, and it was the only way that I felt like I could function was to stay high. Because when I was sober, there was the pain. If I was high, I, I, didn't, I was numb, I didn't feel any pain. But Andrea's numbness turned to rage one night when Officer Gary Bevel came upon Jackson smashing in her own car windows. Yeah, I had been drinking all that day. I had been snorting cocaine. I had been smoking reefer. I remember walking out the bar. I remember getting in my car. And that's basically the last thing I actually physically remember. Resisting arrest, Officer Bevel struggled to get Jackson into his patrol car. I remember he hit my head up against the car door. I remember that. And I kept hollering, um, hollering why? why are you beating on me? Why are you beating on me? Because I had been raped before like that. Officer Bevel had not frisked Jackson and had no idea she was carrying a gun. Bevel was shot by Andrea five times in the back of his patrol car. 
Andrea Hicks Jackson was convicted of murder and sentenced to death for killing a police officer. When Andrea was sentenced in 1984, sentenced to death, uh, and she was the only woman on death row in Florida at that time. It was like being on the outside and watching it. You know, you want to scream out, you know, I didn't mean to do this. If I'd had any control, it would have never happened. My um, sons were five and three when I came to prison. So they were very young and they didn't understand or realize what was going on. All they knew is that they wanted their mother home. But the hardest part I had was when they came and they had to leave. And I remember my youngest son, he used to always try to reach out to me, you know, come with me, come with me. And that was really hard to see them leave. I think it's important to realize that the women on death row don't cease to be mothers, just like they don't cease to be human beings when they're incarcerated. After five years on death row, Andrea's execution date was set for March of 1989. Only hours before she was to die by electrocution, a 120-day stay of execution was issued. The appellate lawyers introduced new evidence to prove Jackson was not a cold-blooded killer, but a woman who snapped under the weight of past abuse and addictions fueling her rage. What I did was wrong. Taking anybody's life is wrong. I had to believe that I deserved to be in prison, but I know in my heart I did not mean to do that. In looking back over Andrea's case and the fact that she was resentenced to death three times, um, and then finally was sentenced to life, I would say eventually the system worked for her. But many of the condemned women who've come to trust and confide in O'Shea over the years had a different fate. One of the most well-known women I met on death row was Aileen Warnos. The movie Monster in particular was done about her. And uh, she was given the death penalty, seven death penalties for killing seven men in Florida. I found Aileen interesting because of the way her mind worked. She rewrote all the articles that were written about her. Like she would never correct the title, female serial killer. She would, that would be fine. But little un details in the articles. One of the interesting things about Aileen was after her execution, she asked to be cremated with her Bible. And so that's how she was cremated, with her Bible on her chest. Another one of O'Shea's confidants, Sandy Nieves, committed one of the most heinous acts imaginable. Sandy Nieves is a woman on death row in California who was convicted of killing four of her five children. And she sent me a photograph of herself with the children in a kind of staircase, step ladder, from herself down to the youngest. I can't even find words to describe how it moved me, knowing that she had killed four of these children. And on the back, she had written, um, or on the front, a memory of happier days. She did express remorse, and she said every day she lives with sorrow that this happened. To this day, Sandy is still on death row in California and will probably be there for the rest of her life. Although many of the women openly admit their guilt, O'Shea says that others, such as Linda Carty in Texas, may have been wrongly convicted. Linda Carty was accused of the kidnapping of an infant and the murder of the infant's mother. There were four people involved in the crime. The three other people testified against her. They were men. Eventually, Linda was found guilty and she was sentenced to death for this crime. Honestly, it was the worst day of my life. It was full of terror, the unknown, in that I had just been sentenced to die for a crime that I knew I had not committed. Given the circumstances of the crime for which Linda was given the death penalty, what I know of the crime, it's certainly doubtful who committed the crime. The atmosphere on death row, really, it was sobering. It's a morbid feeling. It's more or less like the clock starts ticking. Perhaps no one understands the gravity of the situation more clearly than Linda Carty. Her close friend and fellow death row inmate, Frances Newton, was the last woman to be executed in the United States. 
Newton was administered a lethal injection by the state of Texas on September 14, 2005. It hit home and it was a time where you have to come, you have to face reality that it could be you. You could be next, you know, or you could have, it could have been your day. Like Linda Carty, Frances Newton always maintained her innocence. It was a feeling of inadequacy where you know to yourself that the system, the same system that put Francis here and the same system that is now sentencing her to die is the same system that failed us and failed me. By the time a woman reaches the point of being executed, she's come to terms with it. And quite often they talk about dying and going to be with God because the torture part is over for them. The torture part is all the years that they've waited. In the meantime, Linda Carty's lawyers are fighting for a new appeal and the chance to present new evidence that she was framed. Based on the new evidence that Linda's lawyers have found in her case, I believe that she will have her a new trial in court. I know that the people who put me here know that I am innocent. My primary goal, and that's the only thing I worry about here, is to try to get home get home alive, let me put it that way. In my opinion, our prisons are full of prisoners who should be given an opportunity for rehabilitation and uh, restore, restorative justice, it's called, by sitting in a, in a cell for the rest of your life. How does that repay the community in any way for what they did? O'Shea now writes and distributes a monthly newsletter titled Women on the Row which she hopes will bring more attention to what she claims are blatant human rights violations inside our nation's prisons. For me, the question is compassion and forgiveness. We all have things we need to be forgiven as human beings. There's no perfect human being. And you, people can say, but this was monstrous what this person did. I agree. And I think they should be held accountable. There are people, I think, who should never be in society again. But on the other hand, I think there are other people that could be rehabilitated. The governor then says there are four women on death row, and I'm just going to give them a pardon. I'm going to commute their sentence because they're women. I didn't think that was the correct way for him to use his, use his power, because I don't think he looked at Elizabeth Green's case individually. I didn't necessarily agree with it, but he's the governor. Her case went through all of the legal appeals, and the case was upheld. Lieutenant Larry Powell, a 33-year veteran with the Cincinnati Police Department, was one of the first investigators to arrive at the inner city crime scene. This was probably one of the most brutal uh, homicide scenes that I had seen up until that point. Lying dead in a pool of his own blood, 71-year-old Tommy Willis, a longtime resident and respected elder in the community, had been stabbed over a hundred times. This was an old man who lived here who did buy in Cincinnati, Ohio. Since then, she's lived nearly half of her life in a cell block. Basically, I'm a model inmate. That helps a lot. I do a lot of helping others within the institution. Being here and going through what I've been through and people that I've hurt, you know, I did a lot of growing up. Perhaps no other convict understands the complex legal process better than Elizabeth Green. After four years on death row and with all of her legal appeals exhausted, Elizabeth's final execution date was set. It was only through a rare and controversial stroke of luck that her life was spared. On January 11, 1991, just four days before he was leaving office after his eighth year in office, Governor Richard F. Celeste used his entire power in the Constitution as governor to grant clemency for eight people on death row. Reporter Alan Johnson covered the story for the Columbus Dispatch back in 1991. 
I would say the public in Ohio was pretty much outraged at that point because they saw the possibility anyway that people, murderers, would be out walking the streets. Elizabeth Green's life was spared, but her new sentence of life without parole meant she would never get out of prison. Even today, former Ohio Governor Richard Celeste stands by his decision to spare Elizabeth Green's life. Race was a factor. And um, when you have four women on death row and all four women are black, three of them from the same county, you have both a uh, racial and a geographic disparity that is hard to explain. Former state prosecutor Ted Franchek presented the state's original case against Elizabeth Green in 1988. For most of us, it's difficult to comprehend a life behind bars. But inside America's female prisons, 55 violent offenders have only the passing of time to contemplate their fate. If I could turn back time and do things over, none of this would have ever happened. I would have never hurt anybody. He said that I would have the X amount of voltage going through my body because I was sentenced to die by the electric chair. I knew from the beginning that I would be found guilty, and I knew from the beginning that I would get the death penalty. I'm innocent. I'm not guilty of murder. But how did they end up here? What is their side of the story? And what will be their fate? Find out next. These are the women on death row. I've never wanted to die. I lost everything I ever cared about, everything. Almost like every day is your last. I want to stay alive for me, because if I'm going to die in here, I'm going to die for my truth. I think I'm going to wake up from this nightmare. In the past 30 years, 138 women have been sentenced to death in the United States. 11 have been executed, nine by lethal injection, two in the electric chair. But sometimes it's the waiting to die that is so excruciating. It's hard knowing that an execution date is coming and you don't know if your attorney is going to get the appeal in in time to get a stay of execution, and that's really hard during that time. It's been almost 20 years since Elizabeth Green was sentenced to death for the violent murder of an elderly man